Hello and welcome back to Introductory Astronomy. Today we're going to cover Chapter 18. It is a rather short chapter, so I will cover it with a single lecture. This amazingly beautiful picture reminds me of a part of Romeo and Juliet written by William Shakespeare, and I quote, When he shall die, take him and cut him out in little stars, and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. So Juliet loved Romeo so much, she compared him to the beauty of the stars. Had she known what was between the stars, she might have compared him to that instead. Now it's true that gas and dust between the stars is mostly invisible to human eyes, but when observed at infrared wavelengths, it is strikingly beautiful, and its densest clouds are the nurseries where new stars are born. If there is beauty in vast extent and sweeping power, then the gas and dust between the stars, called the interstellar medium or ISM, could steal worship from the garish stars. This opening picture right here shows a region of interstellar medium and you can see that it can occasionally glow as what we call nebulae. This is an optical view of the Orion Nebula taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. It is a large mosaic of a billion bits of data stitched together from hundreds of smaller images. This particular region is about 1500 light years away and heavily populated with thousands of young stars that have emerged from the loose matter of the surrounding nebulosity. In this chapter, we're going to cover what is the interstellar medium and the different types of nebulae. Emission nebulae, dark dust clouds. We're going to talk about the 21 centimeter radiation, which is very important in radio astronomy. And we're going to conclude with interstellar molecules. This wide angle view of our Milky Way galaxy shows the dark regions, which are dust clouds. And what dust clouds are is basically just like the name implies, dust in our line of sight that blocks light from the stars beyond. This picture is spanning nearly 180 degrees. This band contains high concentrations of stars, as well as interstellar gas and dust. The white box right there shows the field of view of figure 18.4, which you can find in your book on page 449. So interstellar medium, or ISM, is basically anything between stars, gas and dust. I would like to differentiate between gas and dust. Gas is atoms and small molecules, mostly hydrogen and helium. Dust is more like smoke or soot coming from the fire. So I want you to think of dust as larger clumps of particles. Now, dust does something very interesting to light. It absorbs a lot of it. And once it does that, it creates what we call the reddening effect. So the light that does manage to get through the dust looks redder than it was before. As you can imagine, this reddening can interfere with black body temperature measurements. However, the spectral lines themselves do not shift. So I don't want you to confuse the idea of reddening with 
red shift from the Doppler effect. This is reddening that takes place because dust absorbs a lot of the light. The light that does make it through is more red than it was before. This image illustrates how reddening works. On the right, the upper image was made using visible light. And as you can see, there's a big spot in the middle that looks dark. If you take the same picture in the same location, but you change your filter from visible to infrared, notice how you see there's a bunch of things where it was dark before. So the lower image that was taken in infrared shows that there's indeed a lot of stars behind that black dark area. So now we know that there must be a lot of dust in that location that's blocking most of the light that's trying to reach us from the stars on the back. If you take a look at frame A, you see how starlight passing through a dusty region of space is both dimmed and reddened. But spectral lines are still recognizable in the light that does make it to Earth. By recognizing stellar spectral features and inferring a star's intrinsic properties, astronomers can estimate the amount of obscuring dust along the line of sight. Again, note that this reddening has nothing to do with the Doppler effect. The frequencies of the lines are unchanged, although their intensities are reduced. So how bright it is changes. We have the dimming effect and the reddening effect because of the dust cloud that's in between us and the stars that we're trying to observe. This particular dusty interstellar cloud that's shown in frame B and C is called Barnard 68. And again, in frame B, we see that it is opaque to visible light, except near the edges. You can tell a little bit around the edges where some light from the background stars can be seen. Because blue light is more easily scattered or absorbed by dust than is red light, stars seen through the cloud appear red. This particular cloud spans about 0.2 parsecs and lies about 160 parsecs away. If we take a look at frame C, we see how infrared radiation can penetrate Bernard 68, although 2 is preferentially stripped of its shorter wavelengths. So let's talk about this interstellar dust a little bit more. As you see in frame A on the bottom, these dust grains are complex in shape. In frame B on the right, is the result of a computer modeling of how a dust grain might grow. And we also have a scale of 10 to the minus 7 meters. Remember, 10 to the minus 9 meters is 1 nanometers. So 10 to the minus 7 would be 100 nanometers. So they are very, very small. Emission nebulae. Here is a view of the central portion of the picture on the first slide, part of the Milky Way, and there are several nebulae indicated. We have M16, M17, M20, and M8. So this is the wide angle photograph of a great part of space in the direction of the center of our galaxy. And if you look carefully, you see regions of brightness, which correspond to vast fields of stars, as well as regions of darkness, where interstellar matter obscures the light from more distant stars. The field of view is roughly 30 degrees across. 
these four nebulae that are identified with the letters M are going to be discussed later in the lecture. So what is a nebula? Nebula is a general term used to describe any fuzzy object in the sky. We have several types of nebulae. Dark nebula, like Bernard 68, is a dust cloud. We call it dark because it blocks light from behind it and it keeps it from reaching us. Emission nebula is a nebula that glows and the reason it glows is due to hot stars it's in, in its vicinity. Start by looking at the middle image. That is a galactic plane and we see a black and white photograph of a small portion about 12 degrees across of the region of the sky shown in the previous slide. So we see stars, gas and dust as well as several distinct fuzzy patches of light known as emission nebulae. The plane of the Milky Way is marked with a white diagonal line. If we now take a look at the image on the left, we see the M20 and M8 region. It is a true color enlargement of the bottom of figure 18.5 in your book. And we see M20 on the top and M8 on the bottom more clearly. The two nebulae are only a few degrees apart in the sky. In the last images on the right, we have what is called the Trifid Nebula. In frame A on the right, it is a further enlargement of the top of the, the leftmost image that shows only M20 and its interstellar environment. The nebula itself in red is about six parsecs in diameter. It is often called the Trifid Nebula because of the dust lanes in black that trisect its midsection, therefore Trifid Nebula. The Blue Reflection Nebula is unrelated to the Red Emission Nebula. It is caused by starlight reflected from intervening dust particles. And the last image, frame B on the right, it's a false color infrared image taken by the Spitzer Space Telescope, and it shows bright regions of star forming activity, mostly in those lanes of dust. So in general, emission nebulae glow red, and the reason they do is because this corresponds to the hydrogen alpha line in the hydrogen transition. So how do nebulae actually work? This is a very useful figure. We have the nebular structure where we have an emission nebula and we can see that it results when ultraviolet radiation from one or more hot stars ionizes part of an interstellar cloud. The nebula's reddish color is produced as electrons and protons recombine to form hydrogen atoms. Dust lanes may be seen if part of the parent cloud happens to obscure the emitting region. If some starlight happens to encounter another dusty cloud, or perhaps another part of the cloud harboring the emission nebula, some of that radiation particularly at the shorter wavelength, the blue end of the spectrum, may be scattered back toward the Earth, forming a reflection nebula. So as you can see, what we see depends or on our field of view and what is in our way. 
So over here on the very right, we have the emission nebula. So we're going to see mostly red when we look in this direction. And right here, we're going to see the reflection nebula because we have a dust cloud and all the visible light that's coming from the emission nebula gets reflected in this dust cloud. So what gets scattered and comes in our direction is the blue part of the spectrum. So we end up seeing blue. There's a strong interaction between the nebula and the stars within it. The fuzzy areas near the pillars on the the image on the top right are due to photoevaporation. Photoevaporation is a process in which a cloud in the vicinity of a newborn hot star is dispersed by the star's radiation. In frame A, we have M16, the Eagle Nebula. In frame B, we have a Hubble image of huge pillars of cold gas and dust inside M16. And it shows delicate sculptures created by the action of stellar ultraviolet radiation on the original cloud. This particular image right there is very famous and it also goes by the name of Pillars of Creation. Frame C depicts M8, the Lagoon Nebula. And frame D is a high resolution view of the core of M8, a region known as the Hourglass. Notice the irregular shape of the emitting regions. The characteristic red color of the light in the left frames, the bright stars within the gas, and the patches of the obscuring dust. Now the insets at the right are not shown in true color, rather the various colors accentuate observations at different wavelengths. Green represents emission from hydrogen atoms. Red represents emission from singly ionized sulfur, and blue represents emission from doubly ionized oxygen. Emission nebulae consist of hydrogen, helium, and trace components. Some of these emission lines come from what we call forbidden transitions. They're not actually forbidden transitions, and by transitions we mean electron transitions within the atoms. They're not actually forbidden, but are so rare that under standard laboratory conditions they're never seen, which is why they're called forbidden. In a nebula, however, the gas is so thin that an atom, once excited, has only a small probability of interacting before it decays spontaneously. Here is the situation of a forbidden transition in oxygen, and that is what's responsible for the greenish color that we see in the Orion Nebula. So starting from the left in frame A, we see the Orion Nebula, or, or M42, that lies about 450 parsecs from the Earth. We all know that it is visible to the naked eye as the fuzzy middle star of Orion's sword. That is the Orion Nebula. In frame B, like all emission nebulae, the Orion Nebula consists of hot, glowing gas powered by a group of bright stars in the center. In addition to exhibiting the red hydrogen alpha emission, parts of the nebula show a slight greenish tint caused by the so-called forbidden transition in ionized oxygen. And frame C is a high resolution image that shows the rich detail in a region within the nebula of about 0.5 light years across. 
structural details are visible down to a level of 0.1 r second or six light hours which is a scale comparable to the dimensions of our solar system dark dust clouds their average temperature is just a few tenths of kelvins remember the absolute zero temperature is zero degree kelvin so the dark dust clouds are very cold places they also absorb visible light as you can see on the bottom left image and emit radio wavelengths as you can see on the image on the bottom right so we we have what's called obscuration and emission at optical wavelengths this particular dark dust cloud which is known as L977 can be seen only by its obscuration of background stars and in frame B when we switch to radio wavelengths we see that it emits strongly in the carbon monoxide molecular line with the most intense radiation coming from the densest part of the cloud. This beautiful picture right here is the Ophiuchus dust cloud. And as you can see, its shape is irregular with streamers to the upper left. Ophiuchus dust, uh, dust cloud resides about 170 parsecs away, so it's closer to us than the Orion Nebula. It is surrounded by colorful stars and nebulae that are actually small illuminated parts of a much bigger and invisible molecular cloud engulfing much of the region shown. The dark cloud itself it's visible only because it blocks light coming from stars behind it. Notice the cloud's irregular shape and especially its long streamers at upper left. The bright giant star Antares, the star cluster M4, and a nearby blue reflection nebula are also noted. Here's a very popular nebula called the Horsehead Nebula. In frame A, we see that, that the Horsehead Nebula is not very far from the Orion Nebula. It is a beautiful example of a dark dust cloud, and you can easily see it silhouetted against the bright background of an emission nebula. In frame B, you see a stunning image of the horse head taken at highest resolution by the very large telescope in Chile. The neck of the horse is about 0.25 parsecs across. This nebula region is roughly 1500 parsecs from the Earth. So it's very, very large and very far away. Now, light from distant stars may pass through more than one nebula. Think of, think about how far away they are. There could be lots of things between us and those stars. When that happens, it is often still possible to sort out the spectra of the star and the nebulae. So let's take a look at absorption by interstellar clouds. In frame A, we see a simplified diagram of some interstellar clouds between a hot star on the, on the top left and the Earth on the bottom right. Optical observations might show an absorption spectrum like that traced in B. Notice how the white intense lines are formed in the star's hot atmosphere. Narrower, weaker lines arise from the cold interstellar clouds. The smaller the cloud, the weaker are the lines. The red shifts or blue shifts of the narrow absorption lines provide information on cloud velocities. The widths of all the spectral lines depicted here are greatly exaggerated for the sake of clarity.
Now, you expect from Kirchhoff's second law that an excited low-density gas viewed against an empty or colder background should produce an emission spectrum. And the interstellar medium does exactly that. As you learn via Kirchhoff's laws, the wavelengths of a given atom or molecule's emission lines are the same as the wavelengths of its absorption lines. Emission lines, just like absorption lines, give astronomers powerful ways to study the gas and dust between the stars. Right here, we have an emission of a photon in the interstellar medium. And that takes place due to the transition in the hydrogen atom. This particular transition is called the hydrogen 21 centimeter emission line. So you can see in the picture on the top, we have a ground state hydrogen atom. So we have the proton in the center orbited by an electron. And it's changing from a higher energy state in which the electron and proton are spinning in the same direction, so both counterclockwise, for example. It changes down to a lower energy state, as you can see on the bottom right, in which the electron and the proton are spinning in opposite directions. So one is spinning counterclockwise and the other one clockwise. The resultant emitted photon carries away an energy equal to the energy difference between the two spin states. And that energy difference corresponds to the 21 centimeter radiation. And the good thing about the 21 centimeter radiation is that it falls within the radio wavelength, so it can be detected with the radio telescopes. And since the radio wavelength is one of the windows on the surface of the Earth, it means radio telescopes that are on the Earth can pick this radiation up. So if the electron is spinning one way, it can flip over and spin the other way, releasing the excess energy as a photon with a lit wavelength of 21 centimeters. Now, the reason this 21 centimeter radiation is called forbidden is because the transition is statistically very unlikely and it is not detected in laboratories on Earth because the gas is too dense and the atoms collide too often in, on Earth. In space, however, hydrogen atoms collide only rarely and hydrogen atoms can go undisturbed for millions of years. That allows them to produce this 21 centimeter radiation and astronomers in turn can use that radiation to map the location of the cold, low density gas in our galaxy. This picture right here is actual 21 centimeter spectra and it can be a lot more complicated. This is a simplified version of that because you have to keep in mind that all the spectra that we receive from objects we see are also Doppler shifted and broadened based on what's taking place, whether they're, they're spinning or rotating. Which brings me to interstellar molecules. The densest gas clouds are also very cold, around 20 degrees Kelvin. And these clouds tend to contain molecules rather than atoms. Transitions between rotation states of a molecule emit radio frequency photons. And in this picture right here is depicted a molecular emission. So as a molecule changes from a rapid rotation on the left to a slower rotation on the right, a photon is emitted that can be detected with a radio telescope. This particular example right here is H2CO molecule or the formaldehyde molecule. 
the lengths of the curved arrows are proportional to the spin rate of the molecule. So fortunately for us, radio waves are not absorbed much, so molecular gas clouds can be detected even though there may be other gas and dust clouds in the way. These clouds are mostly molecular hydrogen, which unfortunately does not emit in the radio portion of the spectrum. Other molecules present in the interstellar molecular clouds include carbon monoxide, HCN, NH3, H2O, and more than a hundred others. Here are some formaldehyde emission spectra from different parts of the M20 nebula. They indicate that formaldehyde molecules exist in the extended environment around M20. So not just within M20, but the extended environments that are represented by the arrows. The lines which are formed by the absorption of background radiation are most intense both in the dark dust lanes trisecting the nebula and in the dark regions beyond the nebula. This picture here shows a contour map of H2CO near the M20 nebula. Other molecules that can be useful for mapping out these clouds are carbon dioxide, CO2, and water, H2O. Here the differently colored lines correspond to different rotational transitions. Molecules near M20. So this is a contour map of the amount of formaldehyde, H2CO, and you don't need to, to remember the chemical formulas for these molecules. And it demonstrates how that type of molecular gas is especially abundant in the darkest interstellar regions. Now other kinds of molecules have been found to be similarly distributed. The contour values increase from the outside to the inside, so the maximum density of formaldehyde lies just to the bottom right of the visible nebula. The red and green contours outline the intensity of formaldehyde lines at different rotational frequencies. The nebula itself is about six parsecs across. This concludes chapter 18. We talked about the ISM, which is made up of cold gas and small dust grains. Now dust preferentially absorbs shorter wavelengths, which has a reddening effect. And dust can also completely block light. Dust grains must be elongated as they polarize light. And emission nebula is gas that glows on its own and is surrounding a hot star. Dark dust clouds can be studied by the absorption lines they produce. Cold gas clouds can be observed using the hydrogen 21 centimeter line. And molecular clouds can be observed by the radiation from molecular rotational transitions. Study chapter 18 and be able to describe the following terms. ISM, nebula, dark dust clouds and molecular clouds, and 21 centimeter radiation. Until next time.